Hello, everyone. Welcome to UMD Media. UMD Media is focusing on understanding, measuring, and doing. And it focuses on the Horn of Africa and Ethiopia and strives for evidence based discourse and decision making in the political, social, economic aspects of life in that part of the world. And today we'll be talking about Kobadis Ethiopia to dry other lands. This is a series that uh, we have been talking in Amharic, in Tigrinya, and now in English. So for those who are following us on YouTube and Facebook, please subscribe, share, and like for Border Bridge. And your guest, your host today is Gita Josefa. It's my great pleasure to have uh, Professor Shettle Kumbo from Norway, uh, the guest who would be speaking to this subject, Kovar is Ethiopia, to as the lens. Welcome, uh, Professor Trombo, for the to this show. Thank you so much for inviting me, Gitacho. Awesome, great. So uh, I, I'm you know, sure many who follow Ethiopia, Eritrea, the Horn, uh, know you very well from your work. Uh, in the past and from your active work still uh, going on. But uh, I just want to introduce to those who might be uh, listening and watching this for the first time. So Shertl Tromvold is a professor of peace and conflict studies in Norway. He's a political anthropologist, Africa analyst and conflict advisor. He did a lot of uh, work uh, since 91 where everything started, uh, I would say, for him with uh, his PhD thesis uh, work on uh, My Waini, a highland village in Eritrean. That was published in 98, uh, but it's a work uh, from 91 to 93. Then this was followed by a number of uh, books, uh, peer-reviewed articles still going on. So 2000, 2001, Brothers at War, Ethiopia and New Start, and this was followed by Ethiopia since the Dirk. Uh, some of the books, publications, obviously are co-authored, uh, as is the case in academia. And uh, we have from 2003, The Culture of Power in Contemporary Ethiopian Political Life. And then uh, 2009, a couple of books, War and the Politics of Identity in Ethiopia. This is the heart of you know, uh, issues we have in Ethiopia, the politics of identity, how it's managed or mismanaged. And then uh, reporting on the past of Ethiopia, the Ethiopian Red Terror Trails, uh, that's uh, co-edited with other authors. 2011, uh, again, focused on Ethiopia in terms of power contention. Uh, and then we have uh, an Eritrea focused book, The African Garrison State. This uh, book, at least from what I saw in terms of review and so on, is very relevant to our discussion today. And with this background, uh, I'm sure our audience would benefit a lot from uh, your perspective in understanding as with the focus of uh, our media and understanding where we are now, where we might be heading uh, in the coming years uh, in that part of the world. So first off, uh, like I mentioned, your connection to Eritrea or to the Horn started in 91, within a couple of months after the liberation of Asmara uh, for your research. Uh, but uh, because we are using Tigray as the lens or the war on Tigray as the lens, when and how did your connection to Tigray started? Yeah, well, it started more or less at the same time, you can say, than my relationship to Eritrea. I started to prepare my dissertation work on the understanding the Eritrean War of Liberation from the peasants' viewpoint in the late 1980s. And of course, reading up and preparing for field work, you also obviously have to read up on Ethiopian politics and the, the ongoing involvement of resistant wars in Ethiopia in general. 
And I was actually contemplating uh, around uh, 1988-89 when I started to identify my area of fieldwork as an anthropologist, uh, both TPLF and the Tigrayan resistance and the Eritrean EPLF resistance were considered. But since I was particularly interested in uh, the ideologies of nationalism, uh, the Eritrean war of liberation was more attractive to me academically to study and also with the hope to be present in the country uh, while it was given its birth you know it's a one time opportunity for a researcher to follow a liberation struggle during the active war to independence and um yeah i i, I managed to hit that spot on so to say mm -hmm. with uh, being one of the first uh, well, the first international researcher entering Liberated Eritrea in the summer of 1991. Mm. And while I was doing my fieldwork in Eritrea, I've traveled frequently also to Tigray. Uh, already in the fall of 1991, I was visiting Tigray. And um, since then, you know, also kept a very close eye on the development in Tigray and in Ethiopia in general. Mm -hmm. uh, that gives you at least at least 30 years plus exposure to what was happening, what was uh, precipitating in that part of uh, the country. So talking about November 4, uh, you know, that date is now the trigger or the day when the war started. But there are many people who have diverse views in terms of where, whether they were expecting this to happen, if with this scale, with this number of actors and so on. So for a person like you who were close to that region from an academia, from arm's length, you know, research and uh, expertise, were you expecting this to happen if CS was at this scale with all this complexity? Well, I do. I did expect it and I have been saying that this is the best announced war in Africa. We knew it would be a war long time before 4th of November, uh, if no mitigating activities were taking place. And no serious mitigating activities did happen earlier than 4th of November. So it was an incremental war. You can call it a creeping war, as we called it, a creeping coup in 1974. Mm. Uh, and you saw step by step the confrontations between the TPLF leadership and the rest EPRDF leadership, and uh, which were taking place a long time before the change of guards in April 2018. We saw this relationship within EPRDF change gradually after the passing away of Melissa Navi in 2012. But from 2015, we saw clearly articulations of um, different opinion, different views within the coalition. And... Um, Already at that time, senior TPLF leaders uh, in interviews with me said that they were losing hope of uh, EPRDF. Uh, not all, but some key individuals. Mm -hmm. And uh, particularly after the change of uh, leadership in April 2018, it was very explicitly articulated that if this were to be continued without serious reconciliatory measure, either within the component parts of EPRDF or mitigating initiatives from outside, either Ethiopian or international engagement, it would lead to an armed confrontation. Mm. Mm. So it was yeah. not a surprise. No. It was not a surprise, yeah. Uh, so once it started though you know now it's six months after november 4 and reports after reports have been coming out despite the fact that this was done under a very strict 
communication blackout, mm -hmm. specifically for the first weeks and couple of months and so on. So mm -hmm. what, from your perspective, is happening or has been happening the last six months? I mean, both what we see uh, and what we don't see, maybe, you know, is boiling behind the scene. Well, it um, certainly increasing evidence, and I mean evidence, not only allegations, but evidence of uh, this possibly being the most brutal war Ethiopia has experienced. And even in my sh short life span of 30 years of research in Ethiopia, Eritrea, this is the third major war I'm researching. But I have to say, I have not seen earlier such a brutality uh, towards the civilian population in any parts of Ethiopia. One thing is that the war is brutal in its own rights between the combatants of the belligerent parties. But this war is really not a war between armies. It is a war against the total population of Tigray. And the sufferings of the civilian population of Tigray is something we have not seen before in the Ethiopian context. And that is, that is, that is peculiar. And you can say that is the surprise of this war. The deliberate targeting of civilians, the massacres in hundreds of civilians, the strategic, systematic, widespread rape of Tigrayan girls and women in thousands, the destruction of civilian infrastructure deliberately, of water lines, uh, hospitals, schools, civilian housing, the deliberate targeting and destruction of um, agricultural equipment, oxen, seeds, mm. storages. All this indicates that this is something else than a normal war in Ethiopia. Mm. Mm. This has an added element to it, which we haven't seen in modern history, at least. Mm. We have to go back maybe to the conquest during Menelik's campaign to find a similar level of, um, to use the term, genocidal warfare. Mm. Mm. One uh, unique element, maybe uh, speaking to what you are just mentioning, is the Eritrean factor. So this is a war uh, on on people within you know uh, the country Ethiopia, but the strong and visible presence, despite the fact that the prime minister and uh, you know many actors were denying that for months, uh, now it's not. It's we are beyond that. Uh, it, there is an factor, and again, uh, like I mentioned in the introduction, everything started for you with Eritrea in 1991. And mm -hmm. then back, uh, I mean, after that, uh, maybe eight, uh, 18 years after that, uh, you had this war on lasting struggle for freedom in Eritrea, a very comprehensive one, uh, 139 pages. Uh, and I'm not sure if uh, it's visible for our audience, but uh, you articulated, documented, the meteorological uh, uh, rigor is uh, beyond doubt, uh, very strong with interviews, of course, with the, circum the circumstances you work within, right? Uh, and so on. So my question to you then is, you work on this and you hope at that time, uh, I think it was uh, during a chat or an interview with uh, one of the Eritrean outlets, your hope was for the international community to see Eritrea under Isaiah's for what it is, 
specifically when it comes to domestic humanitarian issues, all that, because the focus until then was Eritrea is a troublemaker in the neighborhood and so on. So now, since this report, we are now in 2021, 12 years after the report, how do you assess the Eritrea you researched through the lens of this report and the Eritrea that's active in Tigray, occupying a vast part of that uh, region? Yes. Um, let me first say that, you know, my connection to both Eritrea, Tigray, and Ethiopia at large is generally, be be generally based on a very low level people's perspective. Uh, as a political anthropologist, my focus is to understand, analyze, do research on how ordinary people of all walks of life perceives and relate to power and power abuse. And um, my heart, so to say, academic heart, belongs to Eritrea, to Tigray, to Ethiopia at large, because all the people of these two countries are or have been suppressed for, for centuries. Mm -hmm. And uh, there is no difference today. It's only shades of gray yeah, of difference. Mm -hmm. So my criticism of Eritrea and Eritrean politics has always been directed to the leadership echelons of EPLF or PFDJ, and mm -hmm. particularly to President Isaias of Werke. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I started to write critical articles about the development in Eritrea already in 1993, <laughs> at the end of my fieldwork, when we saw what was happening very early on with the persecution of Jehovah's Witnesses, with the cleansing out of dissent fighters within EPLF and so on and so forth, mm -hmm. with the killings, my Hubbard killings of handicapped fighters in 1994. Mm -hmm. so, so I was very early on crying out that the, the, the political developments in Eritrea were in the wrong direction from day one. Mm. It, a democracy wasn't established in Eritrea. And it, I don't think it was ever the intention of President Isaias to allow democracy and freedom for the Eritrean people. It was just a different kind of dictatorship. Mm. You had got rid of the yoke of Mengistu and uh, Dirk, but you got a new dictator <laughs> hmm. uh, by their own and that was clearly visible in my views from from early on in Eritrea at least from 95 96 and uh, so when I wrote that report uh, as part of a bigger project exactly to advocate for the international community to assess Eritrea, not on its so-called destabilizing role in the Horn of Africa, where the UN sanctions were grounded in, but to assess Eritrea based on its internal human rights abuses, and that the sanctions should be redefined to be grounded in the very dire human rights and humanitarian situation in Eritrea, particularly experienced after the 2001 crackdown. And I think this report, we it was used as an um, advocacy basis towards UN in particular, but also other international fora to argue for a special rapporteur on human rights on Eritrea. And that's what it ended with which is still in, in operation. And then later on, the, the Special Commissions on Human Rights on Eritrea. So this was kind of a precursor to all these later subsequent reports criticizing the Eritrean regime of doing widespread human rights abuses, crimes against humanity, against its own people. And I think it is an important backdrop, Getachew, as you point out, towards what is happening today in Tigray, with the Eritrean, with the extreme, I have to say, 
Eritrean forces, military forces, abuses and atrocities against the Tigrayan civilian population. Of course, this is a complicated context. And um, as the Nuremberg process have taught us, every soldier is responsible for his or her own misconduct mm. and own breach of international humanitarian law. I don't excuse any Eritrean soldiers who are raping Tigrayan women or who are killing Tigrayan boys. They should be held accountable for their actions. But we can understand or explain where they are coming from. They are coming from a system which have been extremely suppressive and where the Eritrean population have been brainwashed effectively for 20 years mm. and where the TPLF and the Tigrayan people have been labeled as the arch enemy of Eritrea. Hence, kind of breaking down the sense of commonality, the bonds of uh, sociality, the kinship between these two people. And uh, an ordinary Eritrean forcefully recruited soldier might feel that there are no options than to obey orders. And sadly, we see the results of that, that kind of breakdown of individual consciousness and responsibility. And you have to keep in mind that there are thousands of Eritreans inside Eritrea today who are kept in jail and mistreated and abused and raped and killed by Eritrean soldiers. <laughs> At the same time, they're doing it in Tigray. So it's, it's also happening internally, domestically in Eritrea, this abuse, which are then also projected and exposed towards the Tigrayan population. Mm. So it has become a, a perverse culture of abuse and uh, human rights uh, violations, building on what has happened inside Eritrea for the last 20 years have been now exported, so to say, to mm. ethnic and Tigray. Mm. That's the tragedy mm. of it. Yeah. Mm. It's interesting you mentioned uh, that what's happening in Tigray just didn't come out of the blue. No. It's, it's happening already in Eritrea and so mm. on. Uh, that reminds me what you mentioned in uh, actually as part of the description of your book on my Waini, uh, this is from 98. And uh, this is about the book where they say uh, how social organizations of the peasantry was breaking up and replaced so that individuals are connected to the state so that the state can do, or the government uh, can do whatever they want to and so on. So mm -hmm. exa exactly what they do also, you argue in uh, the border uh, mm -hmm. when people to people, you know, maintain or try their best to mm -hmm. get connected, be connected, remain connected. Uh, and the elites, you call them the elites, you know, uh, have a different approach and so on. Mm -hmm. Maybe, you know, uh, going back to what we are mentioning about this uh, report, uh, just this week, uh, the PBS released uh, a very touching and gruesome uh, documentary. I just want to play for our audience a very short clip on uh, what that is about. Uh, in a safe house in Ethiopia's capital, we met a man named Michael. He just escaped from Eritrea and smuggled out something remarkable. Secretly shot footage from inside one of the country's military-run prisons. And this is 
ሓደ ጭጥ መራገጽ ናይት ስርዓት ማለት እዩ ትመን ሰይት ህዝቢ ጭቆን ከም ዘሎ ብዙሕ ግፍታታ ህዝቢ ኤርትራ ወርድ ከም ዘሎ ንመርጋጽ ማለት እዩ እንይሽይ ካብ ዝብዙሕ ነገር ካሓደ ካብ ሓደስ ብጨልፋ ማለት እዩ እትናትና ዛራርባ ወሕጂ አነ ዝፈቀደኛ ዘይኮንኩ ድህነት ናይ ስድራቤት ናይት ኻለ ማለት እዩ ማህንያቱ ትስራዓት ነቲ ሕንሕነ በቃ ከምዚ እነነ ነቲ ዘሎ ሲ ንምድኻም ትራይ Michael told us he was arrested in 2011 for trying to avoid military service. He was then held here in Adia Beto prison just outside the capital Asmara for more than 4 years. He said a sympathetic guard helped him smuggle in a small camera. And he worked with one other trusted prisoner. بز تحت جبا تي الله ناب زمالتي جبا لوت جاكيت او شتي قرار الله تاتا جبا مالتي تاع جاكيت the other inmates were not aware michael was filming هو اجي ز نغار ز تاع تحيزو تاع زخون ردو نغاري ማለት በዘረባ ተዛሪቦም ከማንሲ ለለ 10 አመት ድጎበሩ ተአስሩሎ ካሎት ብዙ ነገራት አሉ። ያ ሶ this is a gruesome documentary by a brave veteran who risked you know his life to to do this and this is 11 years after the report and i understand from what you say that there were a number of developments based on your report in terms of the special rapporteur and other uh, monitoring and so on uh, but given that what we are seeing is you know even now uh, Eritrea more than ever before under Etias is more emboldened you know to do mm-hmm. not only domestically but uh, you know expanding the same mm-hmm. gruesome uh, aggression of human rights in uh, to grai for example so how do you how do you assess you know the uh, response of the international community uh, do we still say that there is a lack of know how or understanding of what's going on or what who is ias is no, that's a good question uh, it's hard to understand but i think you know having done research also on Eritrea for 30 years or more and uh, particularly tried to understand the uh, thinking the rationality of Isaias Abwerki because he certainly has a political rationality in his own mindset it's not the rationality we scholars or western diplomats or you know outsiders uh, can easily understand and that's i think is the key failure of international diplomacy or western diplomacy to Eritrea that they try to understand the size of work based on our own rationality and then basically they say you know he's he's irrational is is often used term you know he's he, you cannot relate to him but you know isaias is quite easy to understand if you look upon reality from his own viewpoint how he is thinking himself and how he then executes that thinking into action and that's what i noticed quite early on that this is this is probably one of the most shrewdest cynical political leaders africa has ever seen and you have had a bunch in in, the, in on the continent yeah and uh, what's remarkable with Isaias Abwerki is his ability to survive crisis both domestically and internationally 
and his ability to maneuver out of crisis. And uh, the 1998 uh, so-called peace accord with Abiy Ahmed in Ethiopia. Uh, from Abiy's point of view, that was a very strategic move, which of course put him in a out of isolation, which led to that the UN Security Councils lifted their sanctions, that the US lifted their unilateral sanctions, that EU lifted their sanctions and so on. Mm. Because everybody so-called believed in this um, so-called peace process, mm. which was never really a process itself. It mm. had hidden political motives, as we see today, unfolding in Tigray. Mm. Um, the thing is that, you know, the Western scope, the mm. lens towards African states, when it comes to bilateral relations, is uh, depending upon, uh, you know, has a maximum three years, four years time span, because that's mm -hmm. how long a diplomat is serving at his posts. Mm -hmm. So any ambassador coming to Asmara don't have the continuity of 20, 25 years of earlier knowledge to build on. So mm -hmm. he or she only sees, okay, Isaiah so said that yesterday, and he says something else today, Oh, mm. it is a movement forward. It is a step forward. We can work with him. We can try to influence him. We can liberalize. Mm. But they don't see that he has done exactly that same move three years ago or five years ago or seven years ago or 10 years ago in mm. order to fool, in order to play the international community. Mm. And he's an expert in doing this. He's an expert in doing this. Mm. And finally, you know, as we see today, He's become relevant again. He's become the big player in the Horn of Africa. And that's what he wants to be. That's where he wants to be. And Isaiah thrives on conflict and instability. That's mm. his terrain. That's when he swims the best in the sea of turmoil. Mm. And, he, you know, best case, you know, yesterday, today, uh, the new U.S. special envoy to the Horn of Africa, Mr. Feldman, is, is, in, is in Asmara. And mm. uh, and uh, Charlie Yamane is posting, uh, tweeting pictures of you know Isaiah sitting on his throne, mm. looking down on this American envoy delegation, and mm. saying that you know we are the peace brokers of the Horn of Africa. Mm. It's a parody mm. of uh, peace, but it is the reality of hardcore politics which is playing out, mm. and no one is better in doing that than Isaiah of working. <laughs> And in, in that relationship with Abi Ahmed, Abi is just a novice. He is nothing compared to what and to how mm. capable Isai Sokwerke is in, in maneuvering in, in this field of destruction as he has created. Mm. Mm. That, that's a very critical element. I was about to ask you about uh, the new US uh, special envoy and so on, uh, how you see it. Uh, uh, maybe we can reflect that uh, later on as well. Uh, one thing that uh, comes to mind when it comes to uh, recent developments, specifically the other actors, Eritrea is only one. So we have Abi uh, at Arakilo and the uh, Amhara Regional Force uh, there as well. So on that, you, you wrote just recently uh, this uh, uh, foreign uh, uh policy article uh on on the ethiopia's Tugrai war is fueling amhara's expansion so I, I just want to zoom in into uh you know the power base of abi where you quote like uh, where you mentioned how he came to power through the mainly the Cairo protest uh, but then how that shifted into uh, you know, more Ethiopian nationalist uh, base, and you talk about even the uh, possibility of reforming the federal system, uh, recentralize uh, political power, and so on. And then uh, at one point, you talk about he might even losing it, uh, you know, in terms of the Amhara support base, and so on. So it would be great, you know, if you can. Uh, speak to that couple of paragraphs where you mention how it started 
where it has been and where it might go and so on when it comes to Abbey, because this is a critical element where the war on Tigra is also, you know, uh, part and parcel of mm. this uh, power struggle within Ethiopia. Mm. Well, as I see it and, and try to analyze it in a bit of a, over uh, uh, the time period since 2014, 2015, when the social unrest uh, picked up in Ethiopia after the passing away of Melis and Avi in 2012. Um, that social political protest, first you had the you had the Muslim movement, but which later converted into the Oromo protest movement, the Kero uh, youth protests. They articulated very clearly a demand of change as viewed from the grassroots in Oromia. They were protesting against Oromo, you know, of maladministration in Oromia, of land grabbing, of corruption, of human rights abuse, primarily directed towards the Oromo leadership in Oromia, the OPDO or ODP later, currently the PP. Same shit, new rapping, basically. Uh, and that was the primary objective, to have a genuine Orumo representation at the regional government level in Urumia, where the people's grievances were heard and listened to and obeyed to. And secondly, objective was obviously also to have a fair representation at the federal level. One vote, one man, so to say, a democratic Orumo representation at the federal level of Ethiopia. Which, of course, then reflects that Oromo are the biggest ethnic group in the country and hence naturally should have a prime minister position. And as part of that articulation, the criticism against the federal level politics, it was a criticism against TPLF that their share of power at the federal level was outsized, that they had to be cut back to size. And that was the process which carried Abi Ahmed to power. Uh, we know that he and Team Lemma uh, were in uh, Kahoot or colluded with the Kero protest movement to a certain degree in order to maneuver in the power struggle within EPRDF. Mm -hmm. And Abi himself has later said that, <laughs> that we were collaborating with the Kero. Mm -hmm. um, so Abi came to power, well, originally it was supposed to be Lemma who should yeah. take over, but as we know, he was um, not represented in the House of Representatives, so mm. he could not take up the primaryship. So they switched position. Regrettably, they switched position, because I think Ethiopia had been a different country today if Lemma Margesa had been the Prime Minister mm. instead of Abi. Uh, yeah. But Abi became then the representative of uh, ODP in the, in the internal vote, and got the support of the Amhara bloc and some southerners. And the TPLF candidate, a southern candidate, lost the vote. Mm -hmm. um, so Abi was brought to power by the Kero protest movement, to say it simplistically. Mm -hmm. And uh, a Kero protest movement who was arguing um, a Rumo centered discourse and change in Oromia and equal representation at the center. But very soon after Abi took power and became the prime minister, you saw he was changing his um, political rhetoric. He was diverting or straying away from a Orumo discourse to a pan-Ethiopian nationalist discourse. And again, it's nothing wrong with that if you if you have a party arguing for a pan-Ethiopian identity and ideology, very fair. But that was not the forces which brought him to power. They argued something else. The base of Oromia did not argue pan-Ethiopianism. It was a, it's, a, it's a segment of the Oromo constituency who support that, but not the majority. So in order to further his personal ambitions, obviously Abi has... His main drive is his personal ambition. His main drive is the so-called prophecy that he is supposed to rule Ethiopia. And he is God sent to create the new Ethiopia. 
as he calls it. Mm -hmm. And in order to push that agenda, he had to move away from his Oromo constituency and ally with another constituency in Ethiopia where who are more focused on those premises, those ideologic, uh, ideological frames, which is a basically an Amhara-based constituency. Mm. And that's also then where we see today within Prosperity Party, and what I write about in that article in Foreign Policy is that Abiy has lost the majority, well, he, you know, very quickly lost the majority support among the Orumos. Uh, he still have a elite support and some Shoan uh, support and, and some other segments, but not the majority, uh, in my view. So he, he needs to satisfy his backers within the Amhara constituency. But that is a challenge today because the Amhara constituency is, is, is not, uh, is not uh, uh, coherent, <laughs> obviously. The Amhara is a huge population base. And the Amhara people on the ground have equal grievances with the Orumu people on the ground or the Tigrayan people on the ground or the Sidama people on the ground or, who, or whoever the ordinary people in the Ethiopian villages, wherever they are, they don't feel politically represented, either regionally or at the center. When we did, I was part of a larger research project last year, who did long-term fieldwork in Amhara, in four or five different locations in Amhara region. The key finding we had from that research is grassroots grievances against lack of political representation at the regional level. They felt that the Amhara Prosperity Party was not represented, was not representing the, 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 the constituency. Mm. And they felt that the Amhara concerns and grievances were not represented at the center in all this. Mm. Very similar <laughs> to what the Orumos feel. And Additionally, the Amharas felt increasingly insecure. As we see in Ethiopia today, the Amhara, ordinary Amhara farmers and city dwellers are also exposed to extreme levels of insecurity and vulnerability outside the Amhara region. Mm. And, you know, so this, the, what this tells us, when ordinary people in Amhara, in Oromia, in the south uh, and elsewhere in Ethiopia hold the same political grievances of lack of representation at the regional level, lack of representation at federal level, and an increasing feeling of insecurity. It tells us that the political setup, that the political governing party is to blame. Mm. And that party has been criticized for the last 20 years for lack of representation. Mm. It's nothing new. As I said, prosperity party today is EPRDF minus TPLF. Mm. It's nothing new with prosperity party. They are administering, governing, enforcing their policies along the similar structures, even similar people Mm. as TPF and using the similar coercive means. You know, I've been studying all elections in Ethiopia. The elections to come in June is nothing new. You see all the same strategies employed on the ground and you see all the equal grievances expressed by the opposition today as they did in 2005 or 1995 or 2000, pick any election date. Nothing new. And that's the problem of the political transition in Ethiopia. You don't have any new actors mm. pushing the transition. Mm. And hence it is not, it is a transition, but it's not a transition from authoritarianism to liberalism. It's a transition from authoritarianism to a new set of authoritarianism. Mm. Great. Uh, maybe, you know, uh, it's uh, a time where we can talk about uh, the war 
but from the perspective of what's happening today and what might happen in the future. So it's more analytical, not of course predictive uh, mm -hmm. and so on. So uh, from your perspective, where is Ethiopia heading? I mean, you can uh, talk about if we do this or if Ethiopia does this, it will go this way, if not mm -hmm. that way and so on. Mm -hmm. I'm asking this because uh, you see the war on Tigray, that's our lens, but to, we see what is happening in Oromia, in Ben Shangul, you know, uh, elsewhere between Afar and Somalia. Mm -hmm. And then the election is, um, you know, being highlighted uh, despite the, uh, uh, what the European Union said and uh, everyone else is saying, mm -hmm. Adi and the other actors uh, in Addis are saying that this election would be the mother of, you know, all kinds of remedies that they are hoping uh, will be brought about uh, after June and so on. So what is your analytical mind saying where Ethiopia is heading? Yeah, you know, I'm not, um, I'm not, um clairvoyant so to say so i cannot uh, i cannot say for sure but building on the political trajectories we have seen over the last few years or last 10 years or last decade or century for that matter uh, the its re history is repeating itself to use that term uh, and uh, the counter reactions to obvious new policies in the sense of stressing the pan-Ethiopian ideology or the an Ethiopianist identity uh, to argue for a strong center, a strong central government uh, has created pushbacks from the same forces, from the same actors, from the same, you know, engraved positions as the struggle against the Dirk from the 70s and 80s. And also as the student movement criticism of Haile Selassie and the emperor reign in the 60s and early 70s. So it's nothing new in terms of how these counter reactions to the new centralizing policies of Abi Ahmed are unfolding. Hence, we can use the history as a mirror of where Ethiopia might be heading. Mm. And I don't think that is a positive, you know, towards any kind of stabilization or democracy or liberalism, mm. uh, quite the contrary. Uh, what we do see is an increasing fragility of the Ethiopian state. It is an increasing instability of uh, politics. And in order to maintain control at the center, the government has to increase its coercive means and capacities of the state, trying to trying to uh, inflict counterinsurgency operations, trying to crush rebellions, trying to win what is basically this deep set political discord between these two opposing forces, the centralizing fraction and the more devolved federalist fraction, which have always kind of uh, clashed at infrequent intervals throughout modern Ethiopian history. And uh, trying to win that political discord by the use of force, by the use of arms, and by the use of warfare has never proven to be the winning game. With the change of power in 74, with the change of power in 91 as, as the backdrop to that. And uh, in this regard, I think uh, 
these these conflicts, the war in Tigray and the insurgency in Oromia, which is increasing rapidly, as we know, and relating to the election, the statement by ULA just a couple of days ago calling for total war, since they view the upcoming election as just a sham. And um, so it is easy to see that the situation in Oromia will also deteriorate further in the near future. And then that can gravitate other, since Oromia is so big, it can gravitate other regional states into that into that conflict scenario too. Mm. And the biggest threat, obviously, to the stability, or not the biggest, but one of the key uh, scenarios yet to unfold is obviously what will happen in Amhara regional state, which is very, very central to the conflict in Tigray, but also to some of the conflicts in Oromia. Uh, and we know uh, that then uh, the recent fallout between Nama and, and uh, Amhara Prosperity Party and how that will um, evolve is is one of the key unknowns, so to say, <laughs> in the near future. But taken together, this this um, very much um, trajectories towards more instability, towards more fragility in Ethiopia. It seems um, it's hard to see how this can stabilize in the near future. And of course, one can have a really long durée perspective on what's happening in Ethiopia in terms of, as, I'm, I, as I've discussed earlier on, on, in other interviews, in terms of analyzing what's happening today based on uh, the theories of empire. Mm. And uh, in that regard, you can you can see that we are in Ethiopia as the only remaining empire in Africa, uh, had its uh, expansion phase, had its consolidation phase from uh, early 1900, and had its entered its decline phase, maybe around 1960s with the student movement. And since then on, you have had a gradual decline of the strength of the empire. And today, you have uh, deep contestations at the heart, at the center, at the same time as you have fracturing elements at the periphery, which is again the classic, classic sign of the eventual fall of an empire. So I think the war in Tigray and the way that has been you know, carried out the atrocity war, the genocidal war in Tigray, will forever change Ethiopia as an entity, as a polity. I don't think we will see a return to the Ethiopia which was just some few months ago. Mm -hmm. I think we are entering a phase where you will see that this war will be the start of the fall of both Isaias of Werki and possibly Abi. And you will see the making of new polities, the making of new state entities, or at least reconfiguring uh, current Ethiopia in a way which uh, is still not yet known, but you see some contours of, 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 a, of a new geopolitical terrain as a consequence of this war. Mm. Mm. Thank you very much. Uh, I mean, th there are, of course, a number of, given your expertise, your experience, and the complexity of uh, where we are now, there are a number of issues to discuss. Uh, but uh, for the time being, I want to end with uh, what you do on your day job. So in your day job, you look at people's reaction, people's, you know, ordinary people's, how they interact each other and uh, with their environment and so on. So. Uh, a couple of questions. One is, how do you, uh, how do you assess the uh, reaction of the Tigrayan uh, people, uh, specifically the diaspora, where you uh, see, you know, from uh, on daily basis, uh, you know, their reaction and how they were 
actually involved engaging in terms of the war and how you contrast that with how the Ethiopian, the rest of Ethiopian people reacted or engaged or not engaged uh, in terms of the war on Tigray. That's one question. Uh, and the second one I want to bring your uh, work on, uh, previous work, uh, just actually one year old. This is uh, Brothers at Peace. And here for me, what's touching is your introduction where you talk about, uh, uh, you know, just a man from the street in Mekale, uh, where he talks about, uh, I think this is the one, yeah. So he, he's saying, you know, that's after the peace uh, agreement, uh, let's call it, where he says, finally, we are once again united, as brothers should be. And you end up also with uh, an account of uh, a man, uh, a priest from Europe, where he talks about, you know, what the peace means and would mean and so on, in what way and so on. So these are touching accounts of how people, the people, you were mentioning, and I truly believe in that, whether it's in Amhara or Romia, Ben Shangul, People are united in misery. People have been united in suffering, you know, in atrocities for centuries. You know, that's the core of the problem we have, right? So, and we know in Europe, for example, out of all Tigray, you know, even if all Tigray is under atrocity, unspeakable, you know, crime and so on, Europe especially has been suffering even the last 20 years because of the border issue and so on. So my question to you, uh, Professor, is how do you see this ordinary man from uh, the streets of Mekale would react or would see what has been going on since mm. November 4? Mm. Yeah. It's a tragedy <laughs> to 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 be frank, uh, that article is a result of a long-term research engagement I have had together with colleagues from Mekele University and from Adigrat University, where we have been working along the border between Tigray and Eritrea since um, 2015, 2016, in order to see, to assess the sentiments on Tigray side, but also the best we can on the Eritrean side, on how they are thinking about their relationship. It used to be very close, as we know, the intermarriage, labor migration, visiting on religious festivals, on marriages, on weddings and, and funerals and so on. But because of this uh, Cold War since, since 2000, they have not been able to cross over and to have that daily social interaction with each other. So we wanted to, to assess that, you know, the enmity, the, so the, the formally imposed enmity, enmity from Addis and from Asmara, that we are at war, we are enemies, is that the sentiment felt on the ground? And it wasn't, obviously. Because people at the village level in this area, they know that wars are created by political leaders. Wars have been created by the nobility for millennia under the feudal system, and wars have been created by the political cadres in the 70s, 80s, and again, 90s and 2000s. And uh, the Peasantry are just a cannon fodder for these wars. So, and we saw that very clearly also when we talked to both Eritreans, we managed to do that, and, and to the Tigrayan farmers uh, along the border. And then, hence, my kind of positive title, contrasting my earlier book called Brothers at War, with a new article called Brothers at Peace, because we saw that soon the 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 
cemented border would wither and people were re starting to contact each other and to cross informally and the soldiers on both sides kind of accepted that the civilians could cross back and forth mm -hmm. and you had a reconnecting slowly a reconnection across the border between Tigray and Eritrea building trust again building social relationships again and so on and clearly articulated from my from my Eritrean friends on their side, they're very, very keen interest to reconnect to Tigray and vice versa. And then, you know, in uh, 2018, this was kind of gaining pace as the reforms in Addis took place. And then actually uh, uh, the villagers and the inhabitants of Salambesa together with villagers and inhabitants in Senafa area of Eritrean side, you know, uh, uh, established friendship committees um, and wanted then to have a big festival, reconciliation festival mm -hmm. in Salambesa in early September 2018. Also to celebrate kind of the formal peace declarations from Addis and Asmara. Mm -hmm. And um, it, was a, it was huge preparedness for that. Everybody was looking forward to it. And I was there on the ground, also looking forward to reconnect with my Eritrean friends. Um, and then suddenly it was stopped. They were not allowed to cross to Salambesa, although earlier the military, the guards have, had said so. But they received a stop order from Asmara. The border should be closed for them even though they were speaking peace at both capitals. And at the end of that article, you point to, I, I highlight that fact that, you know, uh, wars in the Horn are created by political leaders, uh, despite protests from the grassroots, and peace initiatives and initiatives of reconciliation from the grassroots are also stopped by the political leaders. They want to control the war, they want to control the peace. And how sustainable is that peace which are controlled by the political leadership? I end that kind of article with. Mm -hmm. And I think, sadly enough, I was proven right. A, 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 a politically designed peace which are not allowing or not anchored at the grassroots between the people who are actually straddling the border, between the people who are supposed to interact if they are not fully in the leadership of that, and if a peace is also at the whims of political leaders, it will not be sustainable. And you saw that just a couple of months after. Mm. The borders opened in September. Uh, they closed again by Isaias by the end of December because it was not opportune for him to keep the borders open, because it didn't satisfy his needs of maintaining Tigray as an enemy. Isaias didn't create peace between Eritrean and Tigrayan Ethiopian people. He created peace with Abi for a political purpose. And, and that's what we see unfolding again today. And I think Yes, I am optimistic that the people of Eritrea and the people of Tigray will manage to reconcile again one time in the future. But it will take some time this time around because of the extreme atrocities happening in, in Tigray. Yeah, maybe can you speak to that uh, political goal Isaiah had in mind? Because there are people who are now saying that maybe from the get-go the peace was not peace it was just, uh, you know, uh, a pact that is right now being implemented since November 4. Is that a fair assessment of what happened in 2018? Yes. And I, I also outlined that in, in that article you, you, you showed, that, that this, was, this was basically a political motivation by Sasa Werke to enter into that, that peace agreement, so-called, with Abiy Ahmed, with the clear objective to further the war on TPLF, to further the marginalization and, and the annihilation of TPLF. That's why he did that. And that's why 
he closed the border again <laughs> uh, in, in December 2018 because he saw that an open border uh, with Ethiopia when Tigray is at the border doesn't benefit him, it only benefits Tigray economically and socially. And the people of Tigray and Eritrea is the beneficiaries of that open border. And he had no interest that the people of Eritrea and Tigray should be the beneficiary of the peace. Because that was a political agreement, a tactical alliance, or maybe even a strategical alliance with Abi to crush TPLF. Uh, and um, that's yeah. what we see today. That's the result. That's the reason for the war today. Mm. Yeah, awesome. So maybe there's a reminder of reminding you of that uh, question on how you assess the just from arms length in terms of how the people of Tugrai in diaspora mm. versus mm. the Ethiopian people reacted to the situation. Well, you can um, end with uh, with um, that in the sense that. This war is a reflection of different perceptions of what Ethiopia is and is supposed to be. Mm. What holds Ethiopia together, so to say? What is it? What does it mean to be an Ethiopian? What kind of identity is that? And how is that identity perceived by the variously positioned Ethiopian people based on history, ethnicity, religion, productive activities, geography, what's not. There are a multitude of different perceptions of what it entails to be an Ethiopian. Uh, because, and for, for many people, maybe even the majority of the people, being an Ethiopian is very much a political connotation. And uh, for many, it's not a positive connotation. It carries a negative baggage, a negative history, a history of, of um, conquer, conquest and suppression from the people in the South, East and West, so to say, who were conquered by Menelik and later suppressed by a centralized Ethiopia. And, and uh, I think when you go to then, what, when you ask what are the sentiments among Tigrayan diaspora today, or Tigrayans inside, Tigray, in, inside Tigray for that matter, uh, about the war, I think it very much reflects also the lack of um, empathy, the lack of solidarity, the lack of sympathy from rest Ethiopia towards what they are enduring today. That we have come to the extent that even a genocidal war against an Ethiopian people carried out by an enemy force, Eritrea, doesn't create reactions of solidarity and empathy among West Ethiopia in large. I will qualify that by saying, I think the majority of Ethiopian really feel sympathy for the suffering Tigrayans, but they don't dare to express it. Mm. Because if they express it, they are looked upon as collaborator of Oyana and might feel repercussions. So, so, but, you know, and then going back to what is it to be an Ethiopian? Isn't it one of the hallmarks of national identity that you are supposed to feel solidarity with another citizen? Even though if you don't know him or her, if she suffers, you are supposed to feel solidarity with that suffering. Mm -hmm. That's called national identity. That's the core of national identity. You are together. You are together in a commonness. You have an imagined community, as it is described by one nationalist theorist. And that imagined community means that 
whenever someone suffers in that community, everyone suffers. In Ethiopia today, that imagined community doesn't exist. Because the Tigrayans are massacred, raped, killed. And also other people. Amharas in Oromia, Orumos in, 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 in Shoah, uh, and so on and so forth. In Wolo, I mean. Uh, Afar Somalis are suffering and you don't have a, a, a national sympathy. You rather have, you know, I don't cry for your victims because you don't cry for my victims. I don't care about you because you don't care about me. And that, you know, that tells me that something seriously, fundamentally is lacking in an Ethiopian identity. It is challenged. It is difficult to talk about that. And particularly, that's what I hear from Tegaro in diaspora, but also in from Tigray. That this war has proven one time and for all that we are not Ethiopians. Because if the rest of Ethiopia believed that we were together with them, they would never accept that this genocidal war is fought against us by Eritrea and by Ethiopian army for that matter. They would have come to our rescue if they believed that we were together as citizens. So and that's what I that's why I say that this war is a turning point for the entity of Ethiopia, for the polity of Ethiopia, because it has shown that that all embracing identity which somehow was there before, that we had a layered identity of Ethiopian identity. When I was in Tigray in September last year, traveling all over, there, I asked everyone, does Tigray belong to Ethiopia? Are you feeling, you know, who are you? Everyone said, yes, of course. Ethiopia without Tigray is nothing, and Tigray without Ethiopia is nothing. We are Ethiopians too. Mm -hmm. Everybody qualified it that if the war comes, because everyone was afraid of the war at that time, mm -hmm. It will be a war of separation. It will be a war uh, manifesting that Ethiopia doesn't want us to belong together. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm so glad you mentioned about the sentiment back in September because I had the opportunity to call my mom, who is still in Tugray, and I asked her specifically. I was trying to gauge mm -hmm. the sentiment you know, through my mom and uh, my sister and so on. So I asked her about the election and who she voted for. And I was provoking her, you know, why she didn't vote for the Sessionist or Separatist Party. Mm -hmm. And she was saying, you know, why? You know, we belong mm -hmm. to Ethiopia, she said. Mm -hmm. And I said, mm -hmm. but I was provoking her, you know, to say, but Tagaro are being targeted, you know, uh, elsewhere mm -hmm. for in Tagaro. And she said, yeah, that was the beginning, you know, in 2018. Mm. Now mm. everyone is suffering equally, she said. You know, everyone mm. you know, in Ethiopia. So she mm. had a pragmatic view of mm. what was at that time. I'm mm. pre pretty much sure that uh, that sentiment is gone uh, mm. because of what mm. you exactly mm. mentioned, that mm. the three party, the, you know, um, I was on the media appearing, you know, trying to tell the audience and the uh, media owners, the journalists, uh, the suffering, but everyone was doubting, you know? They, they didn't even, when I mentioned about my own mom, I didn't hear from her for 80 days. Nobody cared. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so the, this uh, speaks to what you were mentioning. And mm -hmm. one thing that uh, is also interesting in this war is the fact how TPLF now evolve uh, in the you know the tagaru psych from mm. just a tplf one party mm. into to like defense for uh, defense mm. force because all parties that even participated in the election as opposition mm. parties are part of the tdf mm. as mm. we call it now uh, mm. but one thing that maybe worth mentioning is how abi is still 
out of touch when he declared or designated PLF as terrorist uh, and clothing, you know, all possibilities of this solving out and so on. So with the US going to the region, uh, you were mentioning about how the envoy in Asmara and then maybe he would be in Addis soon, I guess. Uh, mm -hmm. So very short, I, I promise this would be the last question. Uh, but how do you see Abi would react or not react to this effort of, because I think the US, the European Union are seeing the war for what it is, uh, maybe not to the extent you know, many would like uh, it to be. But how do you see the next three, four days uh, are we reacting to what the European Union and the US are doing? Yeah. Um, I think uh, the Abi has been quite consistent in his rejection of um, foreign involvement in kind of mediating the war and uh, he was very quick out with uh, pushing back and shooting down any initiative be that from the EU envoys from uh, EU and uh, bilateral uh, initiatives to say that you know stay away this is a domestic law enforcement operation it is nothing to do with you guys um, and he has maintained that position still, basically. But everybody knows that it's not, um, it were not a law operation in 4th of November. It's not a law operation, enforcement operation today. It is an all out war, an internationalized war with the involvement of Eritrea, although it is not really in an international humanitarian law uh, definition, an internationalized uh, war, because Eritrea is invited in as an ally by the Ethiopian government. Um, so it is not an alien, uh, hostile force. So I think, but something has changed in terms of the international um, pressure since um, the Biden administration took power. In the sense that the U.S. have changed 180 degrees. Trump was, you know, Trump couldn't care less, and uh, and he sent his uh, envoy to Bornaji and uh, appeasing Abi not criticizing Abi, mm. uh, and uh, not wanting to hear that um, this was any big war, so to say. Um, EU, EU delegation, Brussels have kept, uh, or EU commission have kept a rather consistent line of criticism all the time, as the only one, more or less, um, and have increased the pressure on Ethiopia. But EU is... Um, EU is EU. <laughs> it is also relying upon a concerted effort by its member states, but the European states differ on how to understand Ethiopia, and very many of the key Western European ambassadors are still rather the glass is half full instead of half empty, in the sense that they are excusing Abi, they are apologetic, they are trying to understand him, so to say, that this is you know, this is difficult and they have a lot of challenges and you have to give him time and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. So that is weakening Brussels position that the member states are so passive in a way. Mm -hmm. So the US is more or less alone in the unilateral, very hardline criticism and which also then is reflected by appointing a special envoy uh, to the Horn of Africa, addressing the Ethiopian crisis basically. It is uh, the war in Tigray, it is the GERD dam and it is the Sudan-Ethiopia border uh, conflict, which are on the agenda for this special envoy. So it is a special envoy to Ethiopia, not to the Horn, because all of them are Ethiopia-centric problems, you can say. Mm, yes, I, I believe he will come to Addis uh, in a couple of days, Feldman and his team. And um, I assume, uh, I believe that Abi will meet him, but I think he still wants to play the same kind of tune, Abi saying that this is a domestic issue, we are soon finished, it's coming to its end, although everybody knows that is not true. Mm. But so far, the Ethiopian government, more or less all their statements have been falsehoods, are not based on empirical reality on the ground. And we know the empirical reality on the ground in the last couple of months have changed radically in the sense that the TDF has gained uh, an upper hand in in the warfare you know the the war is now on the more 
defined by TDF offensives than they are by Eritrean and Ethiopian offensives. So that it has changed. And um, that might put Abi in a bit different uh, corner in the sense of trying maybe to, if he understands and acknowledge that ENDF is about to lose it militarily, he might want to try to negotiate a deal before that happening in order to save his remaining kind of control over the process. But I'm not sure he is aware of that. I'm not sure that he is actually understanding uh, the dynamics on the ground. And uh, hence, I think he will uh, continue to insist that this is a law enforcement operation. And he will continue to claim that um, humanitarian access is um, unimpeded, which it is not. Uh, and I believe the Americans will uh, be forced to increase the pressure on Ethiopia after this trip because of the extremely dire humanitarian situation facing the majority of the Tigrayan people. Um, and um, it might be that we rather soon will see punitive actions against Eritrea in particular, but maybe also selective sanctions against Ethiopia. And uh, you might have an, a, a more push then in order to save the hundreds of thousands of lives of Tegaro, who is on the brink of starvation. So uh, it's still a long way to go before a diplomatic solution is found here. But you might have some incremental steps pushing more and more Abi into a corner. And that in combination with uh, ENDF and Eritrean forces losing terrain on the ground might press him to the negotiation table. But that won't happen before the election and that won't happen before, you know, the rainy season. They are trying to fight it out before that, hoping for a miracle on the ground, uh, which is not happening. Uh, and we might see some kind of movement in um, diplomatic terms during uh, July, August, hopefully at least. Mm. Great. That uh, brings us to the end of the show with a very uh, good perspective in terms of what could play out uh, at what uh, under what uh, circumstances and so on. So it has been a very uh, pleasure of mine to have you on my show uh, and uh, to deep uh, from your vast experience and expertise in the region. And I'm sure uh, our audience benefit from uh, this insight in terms of understanding what's going on, what could go wrong and how to make it uh, right. T thank you so much for being in the show today, uh, Professor Tromwa. Thank you so much, Kitasho, for having me. It was a pleasure discussing this with you. Awesome. Okay, our viewers, uh, this was UMD's, uh, UMD Media's show on uh, Kovadis Ethiopia. To grow other lands. Our guest today was Professor Shetel Tromvo, who is an expert in the Horn of Africa, starting from Eritrea, Ethiopia, and uh, uh, Tanzania, Zanzibar, uh, all that region. And please, uh, if you are following this on YouTube and uh, Facebook, uh, for broader reach and audience, uh, share, subscribe, and like. Uh, and we'll come uh, with uh, another guest on the same topic and other topics in the coming days. Your host was Gita Chosafa. Bye for now. <laughs>